It is a great honor for me to welcome you all to the Peace Palace and to the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. The Peace Palace and the United Nations are a perfect fit. They are both dedicated from their very inception to peace and harmony among nations. Today, the Peace Palace is the seat of the International Court of Justice, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. The court was established to save future generations from the scourge of wars that twice brought untold tragedy to the entire world in the 20th century. For the sake of the youth representatives who are with us here today, it might be useful to recall some of the commitments of the people of the United Nations whom you represent here today, but who were represented in San Francisco by an older generation. They committed in the Charter on behalf of all the people of the world, one, to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors. Two, to unite their strength to maintain international peace and security. Three, to ensure by the acceptance of the principles and the institutional methods of the United Nations that armed force shall not be used save in the common interest. And finally, to employ international machinery for the promotion of the economic and social advancement of all peoples. These are all pledges taken by the representatives of the peoples in the preamble of the Charter of the United Nations. Despite these pledges, we still see conflicts, violence, and large-scale human suffering in many parts of the world. We have to admit that this is not actually due mainly to the malfunctioning or the failure of the United Nations and its organs, or of the rules and principles established in the UN Charter. It is rather due to the lack of political will to use the institutions of the UN and to apply the rules of the Charter of the United Nations. Of course, the United Nations is like all human institutions. It's not a perfect one. It, it has its deficiencies, it has its shortcomings. But it cannot do more than its member states want it to accomplish. It is made up of member states. So speaking the language of peace may be easy, but living together in peace often requires courage. And I will give you an example because I'm from Somalia. And in my culture, you greet those you meet every day with the word nabat, which means peace. You greet everyone in peace when you meet them. Yet, peace has eluded my nation for the past 30 years. Both the United Nations and the African Union have tried and are still trying to help with peacekeeping and peacemaking missions on the ground. However, it is ultimately for the Somali people themselves to resolve their conflict and to learn to live together in peace. What they say to each other every day, Nabat. This is not the first time the United Nations has come to the succor of the Somali people. It was with the assistance of the United Nations that actually Somalia acceded to independence in 1960. It was also by virtue of the UN Charter and the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples that all African nations were able to throw off the yoke of colonialism and take their rightful place in the community of nations. 
I would not probably be standing here today in front of you as president of the International Court of Justice if it was not for the process of decolonization which was carried out and spearheaded by the United Nations. I therefore have a personal reason to celebrate the past 75 years of the United Nations. But I also have an institutional reason to celebrate because the International Court of Justice is the home of peacemaking among nations through the law. In the past 75 years, the court has proudly assumed its role as a guardian of the international rule of law. Its action is, however, based on the consent of states. They have to uh, be willing to accept or they must have accepted in advance the jurisdiction of the court to resolve their disputes peacefully. In other words, they must have faith in the rule of law and in the capacity of, of an independent judicial body to interpret it and apply it. The good news is that this faith, has, this faith has substantially increased in the past 25 years. More trust is placed today in the work of the court than ever before. But to avoid the risk of regression and a return to world wars, barbarism, and widespread atrocities of the past, because you know that's what we had in the past, before the United Nations. My message today to the youth is to carry forward the beacon of peace and justice set alight by the UN Charter. You have the power to influence and guide your peoples for the common good. You can foster tolerance and understanding among nations and within nations. You can educate your peers not to hate those who are different from them and to live in peace and harmony with others. In the words of the famous American poet, Denise Levertov, you can give them the imagination of peace to ouster the intense familiar imagination of disaster. However, you will have to keep in mind at the same time, and I quote from the poem of uh, Denis Levertov, Making Peace, that peace, like a poem, is not there ahead of itself, cannot be imagined before it's made, cannot be known except in the words of its making. Grammar of justice, syntax of mutual aid. This is what we do here in this great hall of justice where you are sitting today. Through our judgments, every day, we compose the words of peacemaking, the grammar of justice and the syntax of mutual understanding through the law. Welcome again to the home of peacemaking. I thank you. <laughs>